Well, we are in Daniel, and we are in session 13, and uh, we're going to explore chapter 11, that is the first 35 verses of it. Chapter 12 is a very short chapter, and we'll take the verses 36 to the end of 11 and 12 in the next session, the final session. But um, by way of review, you may recall that chapter 10 was really a prelude. In fact, I think I have an organizational, yeah, okay. Let's just refresh ourselves where we are in the, in the book. Book of Daniel is obviously 12 chapters. First six are historical. The second six chapters are visions. The first six we went through, of course, seeing him deported, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the fiery furnace, the lesson in pride that caused Nebuchadnezzar himself to write a chapter in the Bible, <laughs> publishing his testimony, the fall of Babylon, which we made into a double session because of its implications on our near horizon. And then we, that brought us into the Persian Empire period, we talked about the lion's den, where the Median priesthood, as rivals to Daniel's leadership, contrived this trap for him. But, uh, and the first, um, chapters 2 through 7 are in the Gentile language of the day, Aramaic. Chapter 1 and 8 and following are in Hebrew. And uh, chapters 7 through 12 are the visions, the times of Gentiles. And we're going to append to this study a two-session recording of the rise of Europe, just to put that in perspective. Um, the ram and the he goat, the rise of Alexander the Great against the Persian Empire. And then the most astonishing chapter in the entire Bible, chapter 9, the pivotal chapter if you're interested in prophecy, the 70 weeks, which we again we made a double session. In chapter 10 last time was what I call a glimpse to the dark side. Daniel fasts for 21 days, and after 21 days, he, his prayer is interrupted by a visitor, Gabriel. And, uh, or rather, correction, not, uh, we're not sure who it is. Most people visualize it as Gabriel, some say others. But in any case, a uh, very special messenger that uh, spends chapter 10 explaining the difficulties he faced to getting through to Daniel. T chapter 10 really has two, several functions. It gives us that glimpse of the spiritual warfare behind the scenes on the one hand, but it also is a prelude to the, most, to the conclusion of the whole book, chapters 11 and 12. Chapter 11 we're going to look at tonight is the silent years, that's the, the years between the testaments that are written in advance, and then chapter 12, the consummation of all things. Now something I want to keep recognize, they're not in chrono, chronological order. and. Uh, uh, but chapter 10 and 11 and 12 obviously are, they're at the very end of his ministry. And something else to notice, if we put them in chronological order, the historical books are, we go one through six obviously, but seven and eight fit between chapters four and five, and chapter nine, 10, and 11 and 12 follow after chapter six. But the point I really want to make is, you may recall that chapters two through seven were in Aramaic, the Gentile language. Something that is lost sight of by many commentators is that we have returned to Hebrew in this book. It opened in Hebrew in introduction, and obviously it was in Hebrew in chapter 8 and following. That becomes very important to keep in perspective as you get to chapter 9, because it deals with Israel, not the church, but Israel. But so does 10, 11, and 12. We are in the Hebrew portion of the book, and let's try not to lose sight of the fact that it's uh, written by a Jewish God to Jewish people, and uh, through a Jew Jewish custodianship. And this is one of those places where that perspective is really important to maintain. So uh, the, the, we've been through the, what I'll call the Gentile portion of the book, but we're in the Hebrew portion and we're in chapter 11 and 12 in the next, this session and next. But by way of review, because it's gonna be important for us to have this in perspective, when we were in Daniel chapter eight, it dealt with the Persian and the Greek empire. And it was two years after the vision of Daniel 7, 12 years before the fall of Babylon. And uh, that's when the ram was defeated by the goat from the west. And a notable horn of the goat rises. And that's, of course, Alexander the Great. It divides into four. And one of those four uh, leads to a little horn that has a very key role, both there and at the end. And Daniel interprets this for you. A leader from the West, which of course is Alexander, will sub subdue the Medo-Persian Empire, and indeed he did. Uh, and I understand there's a major motion picture coming out on his life. Let's hope they do a good job. Obviously, I haven't seen it yet, but let's hope they do a diligent job, because it's quite a dramatic story. 
But he dies at a very young age, and his, four of his key generals divide up the empire. Cassander takes the far west, Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus takes Thrace, Bithynia, and most of Asia Minor. Ta the two big gorillas on the block, if you will, are Ptolemy and Seleucus. Ptolemy takes the south, Egypt, Cyrene, Arabia, Patria. And Seleucus takes Syria and, and the lands all the way east, all the way to India. And uh, it's these two people, Ptolemy and Seleucus, and the rivalries between those two dynasties that are very, very important in the history of Israel from their perspective because they are a buffer between these two rivals. And uh, I want, to, want you to notice that it was in the days of Ptolemy that the Septuagint was translated. So it is, uh, we'll, we'll show you that a little more clearly. And uh, now Daniel 8, of course, dealt with Alexander the Great's career in the first eight verses. And then they were interpreted, uh, also seven of those, they were interpreted uh, for us by uh, Daniel. But we spent a lot of time on Antiochus Epiphanes. We're going to hear more about him tonight. But I want that to be fresh in your mind as we go from chapter 8 as we get into chapter 11. Because some of the allusions to Antiochus Epiphanes are a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. And scholars will differ on some of the details, but clearly uh, there are aspects to his career and uh, exploits that uh, foreshadow. In fact, Jesus himself makes that illusion for us. So we really won't understand what Jesus is pointing to unless we do our historical homework and understand who Antiochus Epiphanes was. So let's uh, in, in, in just to re refresh your memory on a couple of things from chapter 8 before we move here. Uh, verse, a couple of verses, uh, Daniel said, I saw in a vision that came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, that is in Persia, which is in the province of Elam. Elam being a in effect, a forebear of the Persians. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high. But one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And that seems to profile the Medo-Persian alliance, where Medes were stronger at first, but the Persians take over, and they become the strongest. And that uh, seemed to be pretty graphically uh, uh, demonstrated and pretty much agreed to on most conservative scho uh, scholars. Verse 4, I said, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver him out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. We're going to encounter one of the 33 titles of the Antichrist in the Old Testament, the willful king uh, in chapter 11. But here we have it even echoed here in chapter 8. And I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. In other words, the, 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 the visual here is that he's moving so fast that he's not even touching the ground. It's, 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 it's sort of an uh, uh, idiom of velocity, if you will. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And indeed, this uh, he-goat, is a, 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 we went through all this before. It was uh, uh, idiomatic, of course, of the Greek empire and... Uh, the notable horn being Alexander the Great, of course. And he came to the ram, which had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him with the fury of his power. Now, obviously, one of the incredible exploits of Alexander was his defeat of the invincible Persian army by clever, clever generalship and a lot of other things. And I saw, I saw him come close to, uh, unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him. He smote the ram, break his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. And, uh, and therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, for, for it came up for no, four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So in other words, um, uh, uh, Alexander died very young, and uh, his four generals divided up the empire. And there was quite a tension uh, of, among them. But in Daniel chapter 11, that's just by refreshing your, uh, your background. In Daniel 11, the first two verses will summarize the Persian Empire, and the next two verses, 3 and 4, will summarize the Greek Empire. So the first four verses are a sort of a recap, if you will, of what we've already talked about. But then we have verses 5 through 35. And that's going to detail the tensions through the various dynasties of both the Seleucid Empire and the, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the portion that uh, Seleucus took from the original Greek Empire, and uh, the, the Ptolemies. And that rivalry 
will, uh, in effect, uh, uh, Israel finds itself sandwiched between these two uh, struggling uh, powers. And uh, this is going to cover the majority of the time, but what we call between the testaments. Many of us have books in our library called uh, Silent Years, which is scholars attempt to summarize the history um, after the Old Testament before the New, so-called silent years. They're not silent at all. They're detailed in advance here in Daniel 11. We'll look, we'll look that over. And uh, that's the part we'll take in this session. Verses 36 through 9, 39 will introduce this character he, that's called the willful king. Again, a, an overlay from Antiochus Epiphanes. In chapter 40 to the end of the chapter 11 is clearly end time prophecies. What is confusing in this chapter is that th verses 36 through 39 seem to fit both. On the one hand, much of what's said there fits Antiochus Epiphanes, which of course is historical. And yet much of it foreshadows, goes far beyond Antiochus Epiphanes and, and foreshadows the final echo, if you will, of this super leader, this coming world leader that uh, the world is watching for. So uh, we'll sort that through and we'll take the last two portions here as part of chapter 12 when we get there. But uh, in, in Daniel chapter 11, first two verses will take us through the Persian Empire, which was Cyrus all the way through Artaxerxes Longimanus. Uh, one of the notable ones here is just before Artaxerxes Longimanus was Xerxes I. That was the, the uh, king that was uh, uh, during the days of Esther. So the, 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 the episode of Esther uh, would fit in there. Artaxerxes Longimanus is a very important date as we determined in Daniel chapter 9 because his decree is the trigger that Gabriel pointed to uh, when he gave us this mathematical prophecy which de uh, details the exact day that the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the prince or ruler of the king, uh, makes his appearance on the donkey. So again, we'll, we'll see a recap of that in the first two verses. And then the next two verses will just summarize the career of uh, Alexander the Great. And, and so we have the Persian Empire and then the Greek Empire, because usually the Seleucids and Ptolemies are looked at as echoes of that original Greek Empire and the four generals that divided up. Of course, we've covered here. So, and it's the last two that we'll really focus on in this chapter. So let's get at it. Looking at it geographically, again, because I think it's important to get, Cassandra took the far west, Lysimachus took that portion that you and I would associate as Turkey, in Roman times called Asia Minor. Uh, Seleucus took the east, Ptolemy the south. And these two, of course, are rivals, and what's caught right in between? Israel. And that's why this is so, such a dominant portion of Israel's history there. And the so-called 400 silent years are, are, in my view, a misnomer. But let's just jump in. We finally got here. That's the introduction. <laughs> Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. Also I, who's I here? Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Who's speaking here? No. Who is the guy speaking at the end of Daniel chapter 10? The messenger that spent 21 days, 21 days um, fighting the prince, some strange um, dark creature called the prince of the power of Persia, fought his way through. And, uh, uh, and he's going to announce uh, three kings. So the speaker here isn't Daniel. Daniel's recording it. But it's the angel of chapter 10, whoever he is, where there's some scholastic debates as to exactly who he might be. It's not, not revealed who he is. But he's going to announce these three kings, Cyrus, uh, Cambyses, and, and Darius Hispasis, the first three of that list that I showed you earlier. And uh, so he apparently, what's interesting here that many people miss, so in the, in, I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Who's the him? The first thing is Daniel. No, that's not what he's talking about yet. He's talking to Daniel. Darius, exactly. So apparently we have a basis to infer that his, the spiritual warfare that this personage was engaged in in Daniel 10 served not only to, that he could get through to give the message to Daniel, that's the critical part of this, but he also apparently part of that was to help confirm and establish, strengthen Darius. That was apparently in God's interest. And these ministering spirits, called angels, 
um, are at war. It's not just push an automatic button. There's apparently conflict involved. It took him 21 days. Remember, you read, reread chapter 10 when you get a chance. It, it, uh, he, he was, he was, it wasn't until Michael came to help him that he could get through. That's why many of us uh, uh, stand, stand away from th assuming it's Jesus Christ because he wouldn't have needed Michael to help him. It's obviously some very powerful angel, and Michael came and, and uh, 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 cast the deciding vote, so to speak. But this is the angel speaking. He says, and now I will show thee the truth. This is the angel speaking to Daniel. Got the picture? And uh, behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. And the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. And indeed, it was their uh, launching against Greeks in uh, uh, 480 B.C. that uh, he, uh, it, uh, uh, the, the king, Xerxes uh, was uh, 486 to 465. And that, uh, he probably is the Azarias of, of uh, Ezra 4 and Esther and the book of Esther. And... Uh, he did a lot of interesting things. He interested tax reforms, and he became very powerful. He trained over two million warriors uh, for four years. He trained two million people for four years. This is a, that's an army in modern terms, let alone these ancient empires. He built special barges and then attacked Greece in 480 BC. He crossed the Hellespont in seven days. And this attack laid the basis for the vendetta that Alexander would capitalize on to go after uh, Persia later. But uh, this is a uh, part of the, and uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about Xerxes. He was, he was a, a very capricious, fanciful character. But, uh, and the mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And uh, this is an allusion to the, the rise of the Greeks, which we've talked about in Daniel 8 and so on. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. We covered, This is, again, a summary of what we covered in chapter 8. And not to his posterity. In other words, it wasn't his descendants that took the empire. Usually that's the way, right? The sons or the sons, whatever, or, or, or those that marry the daughters, whatever. No, this is not posterity here. And not to his posterity. No, it went primarily to some of the school chums. Guys that had been loyal to him through all the escapades and so forth, Lysimachus and Ptolemy particularly. Nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. Indeed, that's part of the problem. There's a lot of crossfire here. He died, Alexander died without a qualified heir. His half-brother uh, was mentally defective, so that didn't work. His, his, uh, he had two, uh, two sons, one illegitimate by a concubine and and uh, others, but anyway, uh, 22 years of fighting uh, followed his death, and these four generals end up dividing it up. And uh, there's at least a legend that when he was on his deathbed, they said, to whom does the empire go? He says, give it to the strong. There's an invitation for a, you know, a chicken race, huh? So four generals divide. Again, I, we've been through this, uh, uh, but the two that we're really interested in, of course, are Seleucus and Ptolemy, the last two. And that's the one that's gonna, we're going to focus on for th uh, 30 verses, uh, from ver verse 5 to 35 in Daniel 11. Daniel 11, verse 5, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. Well, this is apparently an allusion to Salome the first, sometimes called Soter, uh, who took Egypt, and Seleucus, Nicator, taking Syria. These are the first of the Ptolemies and the, and the Seleucids, uh, right after Alexander. And uh, this, these, these two dynasties begin 150 years of warfare between them. And in these warfares, continually trample back and forth through Israel, which is, as you'll see as we go forward here, it, it's all summarized, but still it's there in definitive terms. It is Summary, summarized on one hand, on the other hand, there's enough detail here that forces the skeptics to try to argue that Daniel must have been written later than it's reported to be. And I'll show you why that's not a tenable argument here as we go forward. And so this, uh, this warfare between the here called the king of the south, which is the Ptolemies, or we would think of it oversimplified a little bit, called Egypt, and uh, the uh, uh, king of the north, which is uh, here is, of course, Syria, the Syrian part, the Seleucid Empire. And uh, this tension 
continues until Rome marches east and Pompeii for Rome conquers uh, the area and, and put, establishes Roman rule over the whole area. But until the Romans do that, uh, they're fighting back and forth, back and forth. And here's a quick summary of it. Daniel 11, kings of the south on the left and the kings of the north on the right. And we go through six uh, of the dynasty, uh, six members of the, of the Ptolemaic dynasties. And we go through, what is it, uh, nine uh, Seleucid uh, leaders under Seleucid or Antiochus labels of various kinds. And uh, one thing I'd like to point out to you, it's in under Ptolemy II Philadelphus, in which at that time the, the, the literary capital of the world was a place called Alexandria. And the Jewish communities around the world in general spoke Greek, not Hebrew. They used Hebrew much as a Catholic uses Latin. In other words, you might know enough about it for ceremonial purposes. It wasn't really an operative capability to most Jewish people. And yet most Jewish people would want a copy of their Tanakh, their Old Testament, that they could really relate to. So they wanted a Greek translation. Just as you and I want an English translation of a Bible, um, they wanted a Greek translation. So under Ptolemy II of Philadelphia, uh, a project is sponsored involving essentially 70, some say 72, scholars, the best that they could find, that would translate from the Hebrew uh, to the Greek. And the work product, took, it took 15 years, from about 285 to 270 BC, and that work product is known as the Septuagint version. Septuagint simply being a fancy word for 70. You'll often see it abbreviated in footnotes as LXX, the Roman numeral for 70. It's just the code name, if you will, of what they call the Septuagint translation. And I believe we, we have four or maybe six copies of that, very variations of it that have come down. But uh, because, it, because Greek is such a different language than Hebrew, Hebrew is very emotional, uh, very descriptive in, in, the, in the deep sense, but it lends itself to word games, deliberately so. And uh, Greek is just the opposite, it is incredibly precise. It has the largest vocabulary of any language on the planet Earth. Every verb has to go through five specific tight definition, uh, uh, requirements, constraints. It's a highly rigid, but therefore highly precise languages. It has nuances of meaning that uh, it often takes several sentences to get the equivalent of in English. The Greek is very, very powerful. So that's very useful. That's why the Septuagint translation is very, very useful because it has a precision that's inescapable. Uh, in in uh, Isaiah 7:14, uh, the word there for a virgin shall conceive is a word that can mean under certain conditions a young maiden. And the skeptics like to say, well, just a young maid. That's, that's a sign that a young maid has a child? No. The word in the Greek when translated was the, clearly what we, biologically, a virgin. And so uh, you can, the, the, the precision of the Greek is useful uh, in, in clearing up a lot of these uh, ambi ostensible ambiguities. But anyway, I want you to notice in this scenario where the Septuagint translation takes place. And that's essentially three centuries before the, the, the Christian era, 270 BC. So if you take the Christian years 30 AD, you're talking three centuries before. And you can understand now why in the New Testament, when someone quotes from the Old Testament, he's quoting from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. What's interesting to discover is that most, not all, but most of the quotes in the New Testament that are from the Old Testament are taken from the Greek, not the Hebrew. The, the Septuagint became the Christian's Bible. The, 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 the Septuagint plus whatever copies you could scrounge up of the letters that were flying around among the apostles and so forth that of course become the New Testament. But, okay, verse 6. And in the end of years they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Now, this is the end of years, and I, what it means after the lapse of several years. And uh, you can find in your notes, there'll be verses to give you examples of these. But anyway, a political marriage was arranged between Antiochus II, called Theos, who was 262 to 246 BC, and Ptolemy II Philadelphia's daughter, Bernice. 
and uh, Antiochus was required to divorce his own wife, Laodicea, uh, to facilitate this arrangement. Bernice was unable to prevail against her rival, uh, who poisoned Antiochus, murdered Bernice, and set her older, <laughs> elder son, Seleucus II, uh, on the throne. So those are tough times. Almost as tough times as we have in our politics here, aren't they? Anyway, uh, and all this occurs, by the way, all this occurs, these events occur after the Septuagint translation. So just, uh, which of course includes the book of Daniel. So we'll move on. But verse 7, but out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. And this is apparently an allusion to Ptolemy the third, uh, Eurigates, who is uh, the brother of the murdered Bernice, who invaded Syria, seized the port of Antioch, and overran Seleucus' empire as far as Babylon. So this was a big, this was a big incursion into the Syrian empire from the south. And uh, get to verse eight, and he and shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods and their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. And by the way, his spoils for Egypt uh, included 4,000 talents of gold, 40,000 40, talents of silver, and about 2,500 idols. Um, and uh, they, some of these were carried to Egypt by campuses uh, 280 years earlier. Some of them were there earlier. But he continued more years than his rival, 24 years versus the 20 of his rival. So even those particulars have been dug out by historians that fit this model, interestingly enough. In verse 9, so the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land, but his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. And so after two years, Seleucus or reorganized and marched uh, south against Egypt and got clobbered and uh, returned to Antioch with only a small remnant of his army. And uh, so uh, very analogous perhaps to Napoleon's intrusion into Moscow, if you recall. He, he went in with, what, half a million, came out with 10,000 know, by the shrewdness of the Scythians, if you will. But in any case, the, uh, the sons of Seleucus II uh, were Seleucus III, and, uh, who, who was murdered during a campaign in Asia Minor. And uh, Antiochus III, who called him, who was, who was, Antiochus III is known as Antiochus the Great. And from a secular chronicle point of view, you'll come across Antiochus the, the Great. He's not the Antiochus we're interested in. We're interested in Antiochus IV, who calls himself Epiphanes. But in any case, I'll get to him in a minute. But Antiochus the Great, Antiochus III, who reigns to about 187 BC, um, he recovered the fortress of Seleucia, the province of, of uh, Tyre, and, uh, and then he uh, resumed war with Egypt. And uh, these are all in the ancient histories, and they're footnoted in your notes if you want to get into that. And so, about uh, 312 BC, a large Egyptian army by Ptolemy IV uh, marched through Judea and, and until it was met uh, in Lebanon by Antiochus, who routed it and captured many Judean cities, both west and, and east of Jordan, both sides. And initially, the army of Ptolemy IV was larger than that of Antiochus III. But in the spring of 219 BC, the Battle of Raphia, which is about 20 miles south of Gaza. Antiochus commanded 60,000 men and Ptolemy about 70,000. Antiochus was defeated with a loss of 10,000 infantry and 300 cavalry. And Ptolemy, indolent, resolute, I, I should say dissolute, uh, is uh, signed a peace treaty with Antiochus III. And Ptolemy IV celebrated his victory by a tour of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, provinces, including Jerusalem. And he was prevented from entering the Holy of Holies by paralysis. It's interesting to me as you recount history how often God intervenes to preserve that for a certain uh, uh, times. So uh, anyway, he was prevented from entering the Holy of Holies due to the paralysis he had. Returning to Egypt, he took out his chagrin on the whole situation by persecuting the Egyptian Jews. So this is starting a, a trend that we'll see more of. And verse 11, and the king of the south shall be moved with collar and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. Now, the south and north here, don't get confused. South is Egypt, north is Syria. Some people will try to make these allusions go beyond that. And I'm not here to disparage it, but that would be an addition to and would have yet to be demonstrated. Now, these are the, clearly the contextual assumptions here are Egypt and Syria. But again, we're going to find these terms used idiomatically in broader terms later, and so maybe the geographic allusions also might be br more broadly con construed. Anyway, he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude 
shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up. And he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. And uh, so that's pretty much what we were saying earlier. For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain, come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish a division, but they shall fall. And uh, so after the death of Ptolemy IV, his uh, son, four years old, believe it or not, succeeded him uh, as Ptolemy V, and uh, obviously controlled by advisors. And so with 12 years after the Battle of Raphia, Antiochus III sets out with even larger army than before to conquer the Egyptian territory. And in verse 14, it said the robbers here, um, those are, the term actually is the children of the robbers, by the way, but in any case, uh, many that stood up against the king of the uh, south included Antiochus and his ally Philip of Macedon, interestingly enough, uh, as well as risings among the vassals of Egypt. In about 200 BC, the Egyptian mercenary named uh, Scopus accompanied uh, uh, him, had attempted to wrest the uh, Judea from Antiochus. And after a temporary success, he was defeated by 100,000 troops at Sidon in about 198 BC. And uh, so none were able to stand against Antiochus III. That's why he's called Antiochus the Great. He was able to prevail. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land by, which by his hand shall be consumed. And so, um, the, again, the, the term glorious land should not throw you. What's that an idiom of? Israel, right on. The glorious land is, of course, Judea. That was in Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, and also in Jeremiah 3, 19, and other places. It's used that way. And he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. And thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. And uh, so in about 19, 197 B.C., Antiochus III set out with a fleet to attack uh, Cilicia, Lycia and Caria, uh, which were under Egyptian control. However, he encountered a disastrous defeat by an upstart rising on the banks of the Tiber, an outfit called Rome. So we're beginning to see Rome make its appearance in history here. And uh, Antiochus' daughter is a gal by the name of Cleopatra. And uh, she was given a political marriage to Ptolemy. Uh, was arranged in 197, consummated in 193 B.C., uh, the groom being 10 years old. These are political maneuvers, obviously. But in any case, uh, so uh, along with Syria, Phoenicia, and Judea as a dowry, uh, and in the hopes that, she, that he could eventually then annex Egypt was the concept. He was disappointed, however, as she became the devoted wife instead and sided with Egypt and with her new ally, Rome. That was something he hadn't anticipated, and that backfired on him. Anyway, verse 18, And after this shall he, shall he turn his face into the isles, and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Well, um, it's about 190, we're now down to about 196 B.C. Antiochus turned toward the west in Greece and Asia Minor, what we would call, think of as Turkey, and he crossed the Hellespont to seize part of Thrace. And it was Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, who encouraged Antiochus III to fight with the Romans. <laughs> and uh, in 191 BC, Antiochus was defeated by the Romans at uh, Thermopylae. And so uh, in 190 BC, his army of 80,000 uh, suffered an ignominious defeat in a decisive battle near Smyrna, where the Roman commander, uh, Scipio, was uh, forced him to renounce all claims in Europe and in Asia. And uh, he had to surrender all territory west of uh, the Taurus Mountains, and he had to pay a heavy tribute of 15,000 talents. And by some reckoning, that's, you know, at one time, was about one of the commentaries, which is sort of an old commentary, estimated that would be $30 million. I, in today's terms, it would be, you know, at least 10, maybe 50 times that size in, ter in modern terms. 
Anyway, he was ruined as a result of this. And so he took it all out uh, on the northeastern part of his kingdom, plundering the temples in his realm. So um, they shall stand up in his estate, a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And uh, so uh, Seleucus Philopater, Philopater, I guess you pronounce it, um, succeeded Antiochus III. Uh, giving his son Demetrius as hostage in the place of his brother Antiochus to meet a heavy Roman tribute. And so uh, he oppressed Israel through taxation, and all this is in the book of Second Maccabees, for those who want to dig into it. After 12 years of rule, he's murdered by his treasurer, uh, Heliodorus, uh, who uh, hoped to take over but is out intrigued by another character by, who calls himself Antiochus IV, who later will call himself Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes. So this is the character that uh, you know gets there by murder and intrigue, and uh, so this is the one we're going to we're going to focus on because an episode he creates is used as a milestone by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to take a look at what that's all about. So, uh, verse twenty-one: and in his estate, in his estate, shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Now you're going to discover as you read more in the scripture that tends to be a profile not just of Antiochus Epiphanes but of the, the, the coming world leader that is yet on the horizon. And with the arms of a flood he shall, they shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Well, legitimate candidates might have included Demetrius, the son of Seleucus IV. But uh, he was held as a hostage in Rome. But the younger son, who was also named Antiochus, uh, was still a baby in Syria at the time. And so Antiochus IV was the brother of Seleucus IV, and, uh, who had been, and uh, so he also had been a hostage for his father in Rome for 14 years. They're very dangerous to have your hostages in Rome because they pick up a lot of bad habits there. They find out how they learn politics in a different way. And so. Uh, so he, uh, just prior to the murder of his brother by Heliodorus, he had been recalled to Antioch. And his brother died before he could reach the capital, and with the help of the king of Pergamus, uh, posing as a guardian of the young Antiochus who was in Syria, Antiochus IV, with a lot of intrigues, gained the throne. So he did it by chicanery, flattery, murders, whatever. And now the prince of the covenant here, it's a strange term, but it probably refers to the murder of Onias III, the high priest, in 171 BC. This is recorded in, also in 2 Maccabees. And one of the interesting things about this high priest is they have found letters of him. In fact, they're recorded in Maccabees, the letters, between himself and the king of Sparta. And you discover from reading those letters carefully that the Spartans and the Trojans were Jewish. Yeah, isn't that a surprise? At least, at least there's some evidence of that. In fact, there's a there's even evidence that they, had, they not only were Jewish, they identified themselves strangely with the tribe of Dan. And uh, that's a whole other uh, stream of conjectures we can get into on another occasion. But uh, again, verse 23, And after the league made with him, he shall, after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So what's changed? Uh, For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. And he shall enter peaceably. You know, just, uh, I have to make a, just a comment about that. You know, it's interesting as you study history to discover how often a small group turned the tail. Um, in a positive sense, a very, very small percent of leadership accomplished the revolution that made America establish this country. It wasn't a majority. It was a very active, committed, small group. Um, if you look at the Jewish situation, some analysts have figured it could have been as few as 13 people that determined the crucifixion of Christ. That railroad job that uh, uh, obviously affected the history of that nation. Uh, or, or, or it could be as small a group as that. Um, it's interesting how often that happens. Uh, look at America today, how a small group of judges can move this entire country down the toilet by their activism and by, their, by, their, by this commitment on their part to destroy our heritage. 
So it's interesting how uh, a, a leader can become strong with a small people. Anyway, moving on. Verse 24. He shall enter peaceably even among the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil and the riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. See, so unlike his fathers, Antiochus IV, Antiochus Pimus, he robbed the richest places of the country under his control. He robbed the rich. Where have you heard that before? And he attacked his enemies uh, when they least expected it. And there was a power contest between um, Antiochus' two nephews, Ptolemy VI and Ptolemy VII, uh, for control of Egypt. So the, 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 all that's going on. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. So after the death of his mother, Cleopatra, Ptolemy IV, uh, Philopater, uh, received bad advice regarding Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, who swept over his army. And uh, when Antiochus conquered Ptolemy, uh, Philopater, he, uh, the Alexandrians brought his brother Ptolemy II to the Egyptian throne. And so, yea, they that feed the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. Verse 27, and both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. And they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. You know, as you read some of these passages, they, they fit a lot of other situations. You know, I'm reading this from an ancient history point of view. I keep thinking of the UN and oil for food programs and the billions and billions and billions of dollars milked that fed not just private coffers, um, Osama bin Laden. You know that your tax dollars were being, making that all possible through the UN and its um, lack of diligence, or worse. Then shall he return to his land with a great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. And so, um, you know, it's interesting, the historians record how Antiochus took Philopater, the uh, under his protection, and, uh, as uncle and nephew, uh, they ate together at one table, uh, but with lies, they discussed policy, but of course, turned on each other. And uh, when he returned from his first Egyptian campaign with great riches, he then turned his attention to despoiling the temple in Jerusalem. And that starts to get us focused on what we're interested in. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and in return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. See, we're, getting, we're starting to get to the part of this that we're more focused on, against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with him that forsake the Holy Covenant. In a second campaign against Egypt, Antiochus was a success, uh, less successful and failed to take Alexandria. And uh, he encountered, on top of all that, the Roman Navy, which in those days was something indeed to be feared. And... Uh, Chittim or Kittim uh, is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls as a general reference to the people of the Mediterranean, Cyprus in particular. It's a broad term. Uh, the Roman fleet uh, sailed from Cy uh, Cyprus to Egypt uh, after a stunning <coughs> Roman victory uh, near Pydna, at the south of Thessalonica. And uh, so the, uh, the uh, intimation of the Romans, uh, excuse me, the, intima it, the intimidation of the Romans uh, caused Antiochus to return in humiliation to Syria. And he's looking for someone to blame. Who do you think he picked on? The Jews. Exactly. So he really, he really focuses an attack on the Jews. And boy, he knew how to offend the Jews. Um, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Here's that phrase. And it's, the phrase is in a historical context. This is Antiochus IV, and he did a number of things. He made it illegal. He made it a capital crime to read the Torah. You get caught reading their Bible, and it was, it was death. Uh, he tried to destroy everything that had anything to do with Jude Judaism. He, slaughtered, he deliberately slaughtered a pig on the, uh, the holy altar in Jerusalem. And if you know how the Jews feel about pork, and you know how they feel about the altar, you, know, you can tell how that went over. But what finally really did it is when he erected an idol, to Zeus I believe it was, in the Holy of Holies. 
And that so enraged the core group that the uh, Maccabean family initiated the re a rebellion that was successful. It took three years to throw off the yoke of the Seleucid Empire. And uh, Antiochus Epiphanes put that idol up on his birthday, which on the Jewish calendar was the 25th of Kislev. It took him three years to succeed at the rebellion and to destroy all the vessels of the temple that the, Jew that the, that the uh, Syrians or the Greeks had uh, you know, desecrated and make new ones. And then they rededicated their temple. And they celebrate that rededication of the temple to this very day. It's called Hanukkah. And uh, it's interesting, it may surprise many New Testament readers to discover that that's alluded to in the New Testament. In John chapter 10, verse 22, there's a very strange allusion the Holy Spirit puts there that clearly points to Hanukkah. And why does he do that? Because I think the Holy Spirit's directing us to understand the background of Hanukkah. Because unless we do, we won't understand one of the phrases Jesus uses to his disciples. As I mentioned before, as the four disciples came for a confidential briefing on the second coming, Jesus points them to the passage in Daniel 9 about the abomination of desolation as, a, as the key to end time prophecy. So we need to understand what that is. Many people are mixed up on that point. Let me just focus on it one more time. The word abomination in the scripture generally alludes to false worship. The word, God is a very jealous God. and It's an abomination to worship anything else but him. An idol is an abomination. The abomination that maketh desolate is the ultimate extreme of that. And that's when you not only erect an idol and worship it, you put it in the most holy spot on the planet earth. Where would that be? In Jerusalem, yes, but where? On the Temple Mount, yes, but where? In the temple, yes, but where? In the Holy of Holies. That was a deliberate move to offend, and it did. And uh, that will happen again. And I won't give you the long version of how often this has been tried through history, but every time some leader tries to do that, God intervenes. Caligula ordered his, his, his uh, statue to be put in the Holy of Holies. Petronius, the local general, refused to do it because he knew that would create an uprising he couldn't handle. And so he refused to do it. Caligula finds out that Petronius didn't follow his orders. He orders Petronius killed. Well, in those days, the messages went by sea, and, by some, and Caligula two weeks later dies. And the message of his death arrives in Judea before the order came for Petronius to be killed. So he got off the hook. But you watch God getting in the way of a premature abomination of desolation. Now once you get to 70 AD, there can't be one, because in 70 AD there was a war in which it burned down. So there's no way to do it then or since. So that's how we know that there's going to be a rebuilding of the temple, because Paul, John, and Jesus all make allusions to it standing at the end time. So this event that happened historically here in verse 31 is also an, is a milestone Jesus alludes to as being yet future. In other words, there's going to be a similar, this is a foreshadowing of something yet coming. Verse 32, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And uh, so, um, that's exactly what happened. The, that, the, the Maccabean family uh, led the, the revolt. They succeeded. That led to an era of rulership called the Hasmoneans. And they endure until Rome finally takes over. And uh, so this, uh, the, the, that's, uh, the Hasmonean period is, a, is that period from this rebellion until the Roman period in Jewish history. Verse 33. They that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by the flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping but with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall and try and to try them, to purge, to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. We're going to talk more about this as we take the rest of the chapter, but I'm going to break it here for the, uh, till the next session. But in these 35 verses that we've gone through, I realize it's probably a little tedious and unless you want to, you have sort of, there's two ways to approach it, just to sit back and get the overview, which is probably adequate for most of our purposes, or there'll be enough notes, you can track this stuff down by getting into the ancient histories and stuff and try to see how it all fits. But anyway, there are, we've just gone through 135 prophetic statements 
that you can count in those 35 verses. And this is an impressive introduction to the verses that follow. This has all been history, which to many of us is kind of boring. It's maybe just a central background, but fine. No, it's, it's to set the stage for verses that have happened and yet also are yet to happen. Both will be true. And uh, we'll take a look at that as we go. One of the things you'll want to do to review for next time would be the, uh, more of this about the little horn of Daniel 8. Remember one of them came forth a little horn, uh, out of the four horns, one came a little horn. You could actually see the great toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land, that's Egypt. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. He cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. This is Daniel 8 language, predicting the same thing we just read, Antiochus Epiphanes desecrating the temple. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, of the kings of Media and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn is between his eyes, the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. It's out of those four that this little horn comes. And the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance. That's another one of these 33 titles. The king of fierce countenance. And understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And by his power shall he be, might, shall be mighty, but not by his own power. By whose? Satan's. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. We talked about that back in, when we reviewed Daniel 8. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. Interesting phrase. By peace shall destroy many. Think about that descriptor. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. But he shall be broken without hand. And so and this, we've gone through these uh, six and nine dynasties. And uh, next session. Session 12, or session 14, will be chapter 12, the climax of all history. We'll wrap it up in a little 12 verse chapter that finishes the book. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer.